<laughs> Hello? Hang on, I can't hear a thing. I can hear you. You can hear me. <gasps> yes. Am I doing this without headphones? I'll feel naked. You good? You can hear me now. Totally stuffed up. So I'm like in, I'm in uncharted territory here. Oh. My microphone and I plugged it in and it was the biggest static mess. And I looked it up and apparently it just happens. And then you've got to do all this weird stuff to fix it. And I don't understand. Oh my gosh. And same, I didn't realize. So I invested in the AirPods and then went for a walk with them last night. Had to take them out, chucked them in my bra as you do, and then forgot to plug them in. And of course, they don't work if they don't have any battery charge. Yeah, Who knew? We tried this. My daughter's, my teenage daughter has lost about 15 airports. I'm sure she's, and we get her the cheap ones so she can lose yeah. them. Then she can. <laughs> I was going to say 15 ones. pairs of them. That's like a. Oh no, we get the eBay ones because I knew she'd lose them. Mm. Right? And then she loses them and then she's like, oh no, and they're not the same. She wants the cord. She wants the safety of everyone knowing she's got headphones in. They yes. can see And then yes. they're like, don't talk to me. I've got this obvious thing. And if it's all hidden. Yeah, that's so true. Cord. That's so true. But the big ones, as amazing as they are, and as sound counselling as they are, which has been very impressive and useful in lockdown. Yes. Um, mess with the hair, Anna. They also mess with the hair. They hide my hair. I use them to hide the fact that I'm still cutting my own hair. Oh, my gosh. Look at this mullet. Please don't put this in the recording. But... And, you know, I was just saying to my gorgeous local hairdresser, like we had been working to a schedule. So we'd been, we talked about mother fault, you know, colors for my hair. We, we had been working to a big reveal. And of course now I'm like, got the longest, most ridiculous hair I've ever had in years. But these are the things. I got my clippers. And I've got my scissors. And I'm like, oh, look, no one cares. I'm just an hour. <laughs> That's so impressive. So just I may be tempted. Get in there. And my it teenage runs. is old. You know, she's good enough to kind of tidy the back. Yeah, that's the, the bit that I'm scared of. But also the beauty of Zoom, right? Doesn't matter what it looks like. Yeah. Party down back and no one can see. I've got <laughs> clips. I've got all sorts of things hiding it at the back because I'm like, nah, this is it looks great. You look very like look, stylish. I, because I found my purple. Yeah, yeah. I found my purple. I was like, God, I've got to find something purple to wear and pulled everything, pulled the kids' things out. I'm like, I can't wear one of the kids' T-shirts. And then I found these amazing earrings which i hadn't oh, even they're very before. good and they've got purple so and they we're do. good and they do. hi hi you wrote a book i wrote a book another book and it's beautiful oh look at it sitting there i know oh look and you've got i've got the the, the one that's got this on the spine mine's undressed yours is undressed but mine's got this part and they just and then it's got this look at this anna in the cover oh wow and in the back it just, it just like keeps on getting more and more beautiful and I can't even handle it. It's, it's such a so good thing to hold. It's beautiful. And I got really familiar with it because I was painting my bookmarks. Oh, I love Don't it. even look too close. I'll just kind of wave Marks. it gently because that's, but it's watercolour, you see. So it's, yeah, oh. it's meant to be an impression of. I love them so the, much. The amount of time I spent looking at the colours and what direction they all went and I kind of fell in love with it. Yeah. And I don't oh. know if people have looked closely because there's little things in there. It's there not are little things. Fabric. There's like, not there's that some fabric. road. Yeah. There's, there's definitely clues. road. There's water. And then look, did you see this? So look at what I did. <laughs> My amazing mask. It. But it's even like you might not be able to see. She's like, she's folded it in the same kind of way. It's just. It's such a beautiful oh. thing. Also, it fits really well. And obviously now here in Melbourne, we're going for a range of masks uh, with the perfect yeah. fit because who knows how long we'll be wearing them. So it's just beautiful. Have you worn it? Do you wear it out? I have worn it out. Oh. <laughs> I have worn it out. And it's been like just in Hurstbridge, just in my local, local hood. And it's one of those things, you know, I don't know if you found this, but I think now because I've got back on Facebook and I'm doing the thing of spreading it, I think people in town know that I write books but you know people in town don't necessarily you know you you drop the kids off at school 
you get your stuff from the the deli. You're not necessarily the writer that you are when you go out in writerly circles. Yeah. But now do you have this feeling that someone might be looking at you differently? Well, I think, you know, what was really funny is that yesterday, yesterday I posted, yesterday they finally released the, um, the news that Claudia Carvin's done the audio book, which is amazing. And I've known this for a while, obviously, but couldn't say anything about it. And, and that really went off on Facebook in a way that, you know, other news doesn't, because I think people go, Oh, Oh, like you've written a book that, See, oh, the, there's an audio book. Something that gets someone's attention and then all of a sudden you're real. Oh, you mean you were a real writer? Yes. Yes. Oh. What was that for you? What did, did Who's you have that moment with, with breakfast TV? Yes. Breakfast TV. Oh, okay. National <laughs> television. You mean you wrote like a book that a people. A book book. <laughs> and then for my, for my mum, it must've been Susan Carland. Yeah. No, I don't know. There was this. That thing was this huge, thing. Anna. I couldn't, I think I just laughed. I just smiled the whole way through. Cause I was just like. <laughs> so amazing. So amazing. That was a really, really surreal experience, but you have endless surreal experiences. Cause you know, everybody in the industry. I do now. We're all just like pouring the love all over and the, the... opportunities. So many opportunities. Do you, feel, I do... do you feel overly aware of the whole process after doing the podcast? Do you feel like you're really conscious of your, because you've definitely got some things um, in the making. You've kept secrets. You've known, yep. right, I need my narrative, so I'm not going to tell everyone. I went yep. on and flew and did a boat and did the whole thing. Uh, do you think? Yeah, there are definitely things. And I think like that Catherine and I learnt ourselves from our own, obviously I didn't, I didn't have, Catherine had the kind of baptism by fire of doing it the first time with the podcast and us talking about it. Um, so I didn't have that baptism of fire with Skylarking, but I did, I did, I was surprised by what happens when the first time around, when you have to go and talk about your book, I've just noticed, can you see I'm only halfway <laughs> doing, doing my nails guys, just. There was an incident yesterday with remote learning and uh, a water spilling over the computer at the same time as I was doing my nails and, you know, we haven't got back from there. Anyway, just apologies. I, I know. Fashion statement. <laughs> anyway, so I was really conscious that it it's, it's another thing. It is, it is an, another narrative about this is how I wrote the book. And I think what I learned is that to do it well, you lean right into it to use bullshit kind of business speak. And you say for that little bit of time, you just say yes to everything. You, you take every opportunity and you don't, you don't hang on in any way to that idea of like, Oh my, the merit of my book will make it rise to the top of, you know, the merit of my book will make people just kind of feel it from outside the bookstore and they'll walk yeah. in and pick it up. Like it's just, I think that when you start, or certainly when I started, and a lot of people in the kind of RMIT in the, that learning world, um, th they do really hold on to that idea that that you know I will I will write exactly what I want to write, which which I think we all do anyway. But and I will um, I will not have to subscribe to this kind of marketing or publicity sideshow in any way. My book will just do its thing. It'll win the Miles Franklin. And, you know, I, I, I feel like there is still this kind of idea of that yeah. somewhere in people's mind. And so what I learned was you've got to work really hard. You've got to hustle really hard and that you, for that six weeks, you swallow it all down and you say, I am going to just ask, I'm going to ask, I'm going to, I'm going to say, would you mind endorsing my book? You know, can I send you a copy? Would you, you know, all those things which we have to do, which are so awkward and difficult, but you do them. And how did you negotiate that asking process with your publisher? So how did you know who they sent things to versus who you would approach yourself? That's did such a good a question. We kind of, we kind of made a list together you know, wish list um, together. And I think what they said, which is, is really true to reach out personally to people always is, is better. Um, so, so me reaching out to people and saying, can you do this for me rather than it coming via a publisher? And I know that's scary. And, and sometimes um, I have done endorsements when a publisher's reached out 
to me and 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 I'm really happy to do that but um you know so I had a list I I assumed that people would say no for various reasons and they did say no for various lovely reasons um and that's absolutely fine and as I have said no before as well just in terms of workload and all the rest of it um and but, so but many mostly yes. sorry so many said yes so many said yes <laughs> Anna so many said yes and and some of them also said um said yes after the fact so I'm thinking of someone like um Chris Flynn who I interviewed for the podcast and then he was like oh I'd like to read your book and I was like okay cool I'll, I'll send you one if that's okay and then um you know I asked when he responded to me I said oh can I pass your comments onto the publisher. So I think that's another thing that maybe authors don't realize they can do as well. If, it, if, if someone writes to you privately and says, just got an early copy of your book and love it so much and says something incredible, then you say to them, that's amazing. Thank you. Can I pass that on to my publisher? But does the personal asking work better if you're Kate Mildenhall? Oh, so like if you're like a debut, no, I mean, I'm past this stage. So, but yeah. If I was just no one, right, yeah. <laughs> going out, and then I approach people, I feel like there's no weight behind that. Whereas if the yeah. she does, so but yeah, I, well, I think that it definitely helped. Um, you know, for Skylarking, I think Aviva sent them out. Um, Lucy Trelaw and Emily Bido, um, both both did endorsements for Skylarking. Also, one of my teachers, Olga Lorenzo, at at RMIT. So it was still a combo of using connections and you know, Lucy, who is so delightful and who I know really well now, she said yes. You know, she said yes to a debut. Um, Aviva would have, I'd never saw the email, but I'm assuming Aviva would have looked at the connections between Salt Creek and Skylarking and Lucy was RMIT graduate. So potentially that helped as well. Um, so I definitely think that, yes, once you've got a book out in the world, and then it's also a little bit of exchange. Yeah. So, you know, in in terms of asking people you know i asked people i think that mostly the people who blurbed the mother fault i have interviewed as well so there's a bit of that back and forth um i'm also really conscious now when people ask me um and like i said i for various reasons i'll say yes or no at different times just of, of paying it forward like yeah. i know now how how just <laughs> the deep gratitude that you feel <laughs> when someone says yes you know yes I'll, I'll blurb you or I'll have a read um and you always yeah, say I, thank you if someone sent you puff quotes and things like that and yeah. you would always send them a thank you yeah send them a thank you I think that getting the um getting the final copy is really important so i know that though the people who blurb the mother fault just because of the timing and where we were at um some of them had to read a bound proof i think it, in fact many of them did which is also a a really hard thing to ask people because a bound proof is not fun i was wondering how you had gotten into the yeah. arc the feedback yeah so they, so they a read a bound proof. Proof. they read a bound proof so so i think the way that it works too is that i asked them i gave them a timeline um quite far out so i would have asked those people in the arc i i asked you know at the end of last year um told them when they'd be getting the bound proof told them when it would be due by always said you know if you're um you you, you know have that thing in the email that says if you read it and you would like to give an endorsement, yeah. you know, that, yeah, yeah. That, yeah. Um, organized. And then, a th and then an idea that they can either respond to the publisher or to respond to me. So I, I, I had that email that they could respond directly to the publisher in case they wanted to say, look, I actually feel, I don't know, politically like I can't do this or yeah. whatever so that they didn't have to feel that with me. Um, you know, I, I know I've seen conversations on Twitter where people get really annoyed about this kind of, heavy heavy endorsement of books now and and i imagine for some people like i'm so not famous enough but i imagine for some people just getting like would get requests all the time you know endorsement requests all the time um so you know i don't know i know that personally it's bloody magic for the author 
just to get that early feedback, just to feel like, okay, these people who I admire so much have said nice things about the book. And I'd love to know from a bookseller perspective, you know, kind of what it means, I suppose. I think that they would, they add a lot of um, weight, gravitas yeah. too, because if they're getting the arc and it's already got all this in it, mm. then they're knowing ahead of time how that reception's going to go. Yeah. Basically like that would be, and then for you going through these stages, planning the rest of the launch, you've got the confidence behind you to know how that, you know, and that must yeah. be such a build up. Yeah. Um, it's so good. It's so good. So much advice. I don't know how I would have done without your what I would have done without your podcast, which I probably is not. We're talking about the book, though. I know, but we can talk about that. I mean, is I've gone back. Thing? I've gone back to episodes and gone. Hang on a second. I remember that. You know, so and so said this thing about doing this, and how am I going to do that? Absolutely, absolutely. But my okay. I actually because. Uh, you're you. I write down questions, like proper questions. I don't no. do very often and it normally makes me really nervous and they come out really badly. But oh. you're going to like my first one, so which excited. is, is waka thumps a real word? And when did you learn it? Waka thumps. It's perfect. I don't think it's a real word. <laughs> really? I didn't I just... Google because I thought then I would know ahead of time. But yeah, no, I'm... Um... Don't know, the boat hitting the water. Yeah, yeah. Waka thumps. Waka thumps. Yeah, I'm a massive fan of making out words. Um, my amazing friend Zana Freylon, I know, is also a massive fan of, of making out words. I I have always done it. I know, I remember really vividly that in Skylarking, I tried to do it with a couple of things. And I think, I remember Aviva saying, um, we, we either go all out and we do it all the time, but you can't just put in one, okay? You can't just put in one made up word. I can't remember what it was now. Um, and this time I was really conscious, especially, especially, um, oh, sometimes I just like putting, mushing two together and I can't, you know, silver gray or, you know, the, 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 there's a, a few of them in there that I, I just mush two together because I just like the way that it rolls off, off the tongue. Um, it mean what you want it to mean. It does. It does. And sometimes, sometimes often those words exist and it's just about finding, you know, finding the vocab for them, but sometimes they don't exist. And, and when they don't, you just, you just make it up. And yep. Waka Thumps was a made up. I thought it was real. Just so you know. I'm so glad. I thought that that is like, that's how that's explained. And because <laughs> in the back of my head, there's no wiggly underline under it. And I know there isn't because it's in a printed book, but so then it adds it adds that the feeling of that's the word for it and yeah. now it is and isn't it amazing when there's no wiggly underline i, I love that i i love seeing it when either you turn the wiggly underlines off or when it comes back to you and you're like yes yes that is a word that is how i wanted to say that that weird <laughs> grammatical concoction that i've turned made from that sentence that's what I meant. <laughs> I'm notorious for adding to dictionary. It's like if I'm really going to use yeah. you, I did this in my thesis as well because dictionaries don't actually know all the words that they we don't. use and there are debates over how things are, you know, especially when you're studying the post-apocalyptic, you're going to have your computer going, what the hell are you talking about? Absolutely. Add to dictionary. Yeah, I love it. I love it. All the time. All we the have time. that in common. <laughs> oh, now there are so many moments in the mother fault that make you go, oh, with parenting okay so it's particularly for me it was parenting moments they're not it's not like that's that's not like the massive part of for me the severe sense of the novel this is sort of this underlying bit that kept coming up where i'd go oh no 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 and one of those bits was and i hope it, it's only it's a spoiler even though it's a little bit later in the novel is and i put this under parenting even though it was a moment between two adults which was don't blame someone else for this right now whatever happens and you probably know when this was but whatever happens right now don't you go blaming someone else for yeah. what's happened because i don't have the energy for it and there's yeah. so much of that yeah in parenting and life which yeah. is just like no <sighs> was yeah. that a big moment to write well i think that i think that the thing about the parenting and what has also come home to me so much during um, lockdown, and I imagine to a lot of other parents and carers, is that it is endless and continuous. And it is all day, 
and every day, and I was talking about this with my dear friend Penny Russon um, the other day when we walked socially distanced and masked in the same area because we live within five kilometres. And I was saying how the, you know, the kids are on every page because Mim is on every page and she has to look after her kids all the time. She's the sole carer of them. So of course they're on every page. And technically that is a pain in the ass to have to manage the kids on every page, just as it is sometimes in real life. And, and so I think that having that underlying moment of, um, just that thread constantly that also there's the kids gaze on this most of the time. Um, how are the kids reacting? How am I managing them? Always that part in the back of Mim's head, which was always in my head as well, both as a writer and as a parent, what are the kids doing right now? And, and how are they seeing this and, and what are they doing? And I think things like, um, Sammy didn't have, um, I think, I think I wrote in at, at one stage, he uh, has a big tantrum and I think I wrote that in uh, maybe on a, a second or third kind of, kind of draft, um, very probably based on something that was happening to me in, in my real life, <laughs> but also that idea of just how enormous that is to handle that it can absolutely throw the plot, the day, whatever it could go sideways right now but also that the, the, that tension we have as parents of i'm angry with my kid right now but don't you be angry with my kid yes you back yes. the hell off because i'm yes. the only one allowed to be angry right now so i will fiercely protect them with my lioness rage at the same time as being very cross <laughs> yes and then there's and there's that trust me, I know what I'm doing. I don't need your advice right now, which yeah. is also hard to come across. It's hard to arrive at that feeling of confidence when you're just starting out as a parent, but then you do. And I think it's taken me, my, my oldest is 16. So it's taken me quite a while. Not a proper big one. <laughs> yeah, not a proper big one. I can tell you leveling up. <laughs> leveling up. So a 16 year old, I've got a 12 year old who's nearly 13 and a seven year old who's about 35. And they between them they keep you on your toes but there's there I don't know when it happened there was a moment where and because I have um I'm on my second husband that sounds a little bit like I don't know how to say that in a way that <laughs> like I'm just you know, I'm on. yeah sorry Mike you'll be my last which also sounds really bad um yeah there's no good way anyway no, that's okay I in the house which is a little like some of the situations that Mim finds herself in which is I am the parent here and I'm not negotiating with you because we can't do that. No. And you need to trust everything I tell you to do, but I still need you to do it. You still yes. have to participate and engage and be involved, but you have to do it the way I tell you to Yeah. at the end of the day and trust that I know what I'm doing. Yeah. Oh, it's tense. It's really tense. It's, tense. it's really tense. And it was the thing, Anna, that I was, you know, partly interested in right at the start, which is um, when, I, when I began working on the book, which was how do we hold those extraordinary contradictory feelings inside us all the time? How is everyone just walking around with this enormous responsibility, which is the care of another person um, and also looking after themselves? and taking their desires into account and their own desires. Like it just suddenly struck me as this is entirely impossible. I don't know how any of us are coping. <laughs> and what I wanted to do was to stretch that and see, well, so if, if you push someone to the limit and if you make them, I looked at Maslow's hierarchy a lot. I was like, okay, well, you know, if, if we know that straight off, we, we're just trying to be safe. Okay. We're just trying to get our kids safe. If, if that's what, that's what Mim's doing making sure they've got somewhere to sleep and something to eat and making them safe. At the same time though, she's also human and a woman and she has desires and she has things that she's angry about and conflicted about. And I wanted to put those things up against each other and, and see how they worked. Do you think it is absolutely unfair in biological terms and evolutionary terms that often in our 30s, 
um, for people who have children in our thirties is when we have small children or older or whatever. And it is also a woman's sexual peak. Mm. What the hell? Like why? What why the do hell? we have our sexual peak whilst we have young children or I do not know, but whoever did that, I'm across. I'm really cross. No, we think they've got it bad for where their G spot is. Well, welcome to womanhood <laughs> in your thirties with babies, oh, and children, with babies, and the endless bullshit of it. Uh, you know, I think that that other thing is too that we're we're hitting this time where we're yes, sexual peak, yes, smart, yes, like let go of a a lot of the bullshit of our twenties that we were trying to work out, whatever we've got that, you know, if, if we're lucky, we're more financially stable or we've, we've, we've worked through a point into working out what our career is or what it might be. Then that's all just whipped out from under us. If we decide to have kids, um, if we stay home and you know, like I did, which I'm, I'm sure you did as well. The bullshit of saying our family will be different. We won't do what all of you. I'll work, you know, we'll take it in turns. Yeah, I never had illusions on that. <laughs> and then you just think like, what was I? Of course you don't. Because when it comes to the paper and you're like, is that, is that how much I earn? And is that how much, oh, you never took Matt? Oh yeah, I see now. I see how that's happened. Like it's just. And then it builds on and it builds on oh, and it builds on. Builds and I don't on. want to bring you down there, but it just can't, that yeah. discrepancy there just kind of gets worse. Yeah. And just get, and you watch it happening and you think, what the hell and is my husband this? watches it happening, knowing how unfair that is, knowing yeah. in lockdown the fact that he earned money and his income didn't change because of the way his job works. Yeah. And that I was there potentially could have been building more of a career, doing more I could have done. I don't even know what else I could have done, but was homeschooling three children. Yeah. And he could see it and he was doing everything in his power. He really was because he's very aware. Yeah. At the end of the day, he brings the money in. Yeah, yeah. Which is that thing? It's complete. It's structural. It's completely structural. And I think you know, you, probably uh, discerning readers will read this on the page in the motherfold. You know, that whole idea of, um, and this isn't a, a spoiler either. You know, um, Mim's husband. It, 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 the book begins with Mim's husband having disappeared on his work site and on a gold mine in Indonesia. Um, and so she's searching for him the whole time. But at some point, you know, she's like, maybe, maybe I could have been a hero too, but I was at school pickup. Like that's what I was, you know, and that idea that, that the, the space that work gives you, and this is just front of mind for me at the moment, because I've got my two kids in there, you know, that my partner and I are trying to rem- do homeschooling etc for but just it's it's just unfair and it I don't there's no way around it the reason that we bitch and moan and complain about it is because it doesn't seem to change even when little things change and I really wanted to I really wanted to get that frustration across because I think it's a little bit like it's a little bit like what writers are doing at the moment about um you know releasing books in the pandemic which is I mean, I'm so grateful and I'm so lucky and thank you to everyone for supporting it. You know, like then going behind the screen and kind of weeping in the fetal position because they really would just want to say it's shit. Like it's really actually really shit. But, you know, I, I get it. I get all the things I should be grateful for. And I think that that's how we talk about parenthood a lot. Like, you know, oh, I want to chuck them in the rubbish bin. I mean, I love them. I love them. Of course I love them. And we do. But I just wanted to be able to explore that in novel length form to say this is what this is where those emotions go day to day, yeah. um, and and, if, and you know and then raise the stakes a little for her, or oh, just a little. Yeah, just a little. Just a little. But I always think of when you are, when I think of especially when they were babies, the idea of you love your child is very much or someone saying you know, oh don't you just love them or whatever. And I would always think, and I don't know if it's an autistic thing, I'd be like, well, that's like saying, do I love my arm? Yeah. Like, well, yeah. Yeah, it's good. Yeah. I wouldn't. I like it, and I, yeah. I love it, and like it's part of me. Yeah. And then there comes the point where the bit that's part of you starts walking around, yeah. away from you, instead of being actually bound to you. And then it's, but it still feels a little bit like, well, I don't love you. It's not an objective thing. I didn't yeah. use you. Like I'm not 
but you're part of me in that same way that my arm is still part yeah, of me. Yeah. And I think I, Mim has that real sense of it's that journey with Essie where she's actually not her arm anymore. Yeah. Well, that was a messed up metaphor analogy, but you know what I mean. So suddenly I totally that's know what not you mean. my arm. Now I have to choose how I feel about you a little bit. Yeah. And you're choosing me or yeah. not. And there's a real moment I can tell you. Yeah. Where it's very much oh, they could choose to not be with me now. They could choose to leave or judge me that she might judge the choices. I oh, I know. That was really hard. You know, that was really hard to write too because I think, you know, I, I grew, obviously, like you do with any character, like they are a little bit like your arm as well. <laughs> you know, you grow this character and and I felt... Um, such affinity with Mim and also so protective of the kids. Like at one stage, I think an editor or someone who'd done a read for me said, um, you're protecting the kids too much. You know, like you're protecting them as, as, as Mim is, you're trying to make them not be scared and you're trying to, and you can't do that. You know, you're the writer, like you, you've got to, um, you've got to put them in, in situations which are more scary. And so, you know, that was a, a hard thing to grapple with, but that idea, yeah, that does happen when you're that first moment when even really young, like when your child um, repeats a, a song or a rhyme or something that, that you didn't teach them, like they've heard it at kinder or something like that. And you're like, whoa, hang on a second. Where did you have another brain that's I have now not lost attached control. to me. <laughs> now lost control. I've lost control. <laughs> and and, you know, and then that just, like you're saying, leveling up, that just like goes on and on and on. And the things that come out of their mouths and, you, you know, you have that moment where you're like, what is happening? What is this just forever now that my, I will be astonished and frightened and um, amused and all those other amazing emotions we get by my child. But I did a Penny again, and I've, I've told this story, so, um, you know, sorry for people who've heard it, but Penny Rasson, again, she was a really early beta reader for me. And at the end of her read, she said, Kate, this is a love story between between Mim and Essie, isn't it? Like, do you know that? And I think, of course, you're always, oh, well, you know what you're doing in some weird sense as a writer, but you until it's articulated back to you, yeah. you're not entirely sure. And and Penny saying that to me and knowing me, of course, and my own life and my own kids was such a joyous thing because I was then able to go, ah. Oh, okay, I, I think I, I could shed some elements of the story going forward then and I could realise that, okay, that's the beating heart of it. Yeah. Um, that's the beating heart of it. So how do I make the rest of the story work around it? Yeah, yeah. And there's a moment from him as well where she's sort of um, this idea that we're so ready to be saved mm. and we're so, oh, there were lines. It's like, oh, my God. This idea that we're so, we're, we fall for that. And she says, we fall for that. We're so willing to be saved all the time. How far do you think she came by the end without, and I don't think it's a spoiler. No. So the concept of being saved versus saving her self and, and that sense of agency, mm. how would you, if you were to map that journey over the novel and where she ends up and where she may head in, you know, in our imaginations afterwards, yeah. Where do you, how do you think she went? Oh, she just, you know, like <laughs> yeah. sky yeah. high. Because I think um, I think early on that that idea all the time that she's questioning, should I should I do this or should I do this? You know, that kind of I heard uh, on the on the a show last night, I think, that idea of option paralysis, like that we're just, you know, okay, will I do this or will I do there's so many options. And there's a sense of that that too, that she has become used to um, a schedule and a life where she doesn't have to make those kinds of big decisions all the time. She just uh, does what's happening. Also that kind of idea that she's experienced um, postnatal anxiety and depression and has gone into that stage of, which I, re which I really clearly remember when my partner kind of went back to work when I was home with my first baby, like, but, what will I do? Like, how, how, you can't leave me. Like, how will I know what to do? And and we suddenly go from being these people who go to, I remember thinking, how did I used to like get up in the morning and go to work every day? Like, 
and make all those decisions, decide what to wear, like, you know, manage other people. How did I do any of those things? Because we are just reduced to this like blithering mess of a bag of milk, really. <laughs> and, and, and so I think that she's, she's been stuck in that too. She's been stuck in that for so long. And so she's, she is just kind of bouncing pinball style from person to person who will, who will help her and who will make the next decision for her in the early stages until she realizes I, I can't do this. It's me. It's me. Yeah. I've got to do it. And, and instead of permission um, seeking. And she just got... gets stronger and, and stronger yeah. at doing that as she goes along. Oh, it's me. Am I unstable? Hang on. Am I unstable? <laughs> I just love it. That can be the that Just can be leave the them line. in. <laughs> Oh, I was saying that the permission seeking and she can't be asking, should I do this anymore? Or um, instead she's reporting back. And so there's the permission seeking because I'm a permission seeker, but yeah. not with parenting because yeah. I know that that's my realm. And then certain other things I do, especially travel. Yeah. I permission seek from authority all the time. But what yeah. if the authority wouldn't give you permission? Yeah. Oh, exactly. it just makes my heart go cold. And that's why I think, I mean, and it's, super super interesting at the moment too given the situation that we're in but i'm a rule follower totally and um and that idea that you would come to a point so interesting to me you would come to a point where you no longer trust the person who's giving you direction the government body whoever the person that's giving you direction and what it takes to extricate yourself for that and give yourself yourself the permission to say okay I'm going to do something that I'm not allowed to do. And, and I, I really do think like particularly, particularly for women who've been brought up in the good girl kind of tradition um, and not necessarily brought up, it's something we put on ourselves, I think. And I, you know, I was absolutely one of those good, nice girls um, for, in a lot of ways for a lot of time. And I think it's huge and people maybe don't give, give people credit for how big it is to, to crack oneself out of that, out of that kind of shell, you yeah. know, to, to really say, okay, I'm going to do the illegal thing, or I'm going to do the thing that, um, that, you know, everyone's telling me I'm not allowed to do. And, and that's what she has to do. And, and she really, you know, and once she's out of that shell, once she has cracked it open, you know, she kind of can, can go with it then because she sees the possibility. Um, but that trust in, in herself, that, that's huge. And I don't think we ever really get it. I think we have to, you know, it's something we continually work on. And certainly I imagine her continuing to work on. But you learn so much of that when you travel and when you have adventures, when you're on boats. <laughs> However, I'm a bit of, I love boats. I love anything that moves very fast, high adrenaline activities. So for wow. me, they're the most peaceful thing I can do is a speedboat, sailboats, a bit too slow. Speed wow boat, skiing fast as i can go i was the teenager don't i should cut this out i was the teenager who learned you can hook your foot under the glove box of a car and effectively like out the window and down the side oh my um, goodness without falling out as long as you hold your toe in right <laughs> oh. this was a long time ago okay don't do that and we wouldn't do those sorts of things now Obviously. so i really i really that like is terrifying me the thought of it as this good girl who doesn't break rules I wasn't, well, see, <laughs> no. I was always good and polite and neat, my mum would yeah. say. You were always okay. neat and yeah. tidy, no matter what yeah. you did. Oh, good. <laughs> she didn't want to know what I did. And she was very good at that. She was very much turned the blind eye, thank goodness, to what I was up to. But uh, but I was always polite about it. Yeah. You know, yeah, like important. if you get arrested, as long as you're polite <laughs> and you're nice, it will go better. So apart from all of that, was, like I said, just edit. And I edit. Um <laughs> So, but when, did you find that when you actually experienced going out there and not just that it was a, the boat and you had to learn the technical side of all of those, but you had broken free and you were then making all those decisions for yourself again. Um, oh my goodness. Was that, how much of that emotional journey you went on? 
it was so huge it was so huge and and i think that even more so potentially like the boat was extraordinary and for those reasons you know technical reasons and the sensory experience of being on the boat but i was still very much hemmed in by you know it was very regular on the boat you know i i had six hour shifts as everyone did there were lots of rules it's a very small space that we were all negotiating um i did exactly what the captain told me as you do when you're on a boat but but then when we got to ambon I actually, um, I got off the, off the boat. It, it becomes a much smaller space when you're in, you know, dock <laughs> and we weren't doing shifts, et cetera. So there was, cause I was hot bunking with another woman. There wasn't actually enough space for me to stay on the boat. So I, I went and stayed in a hotel and for that, I think it was three or four days on this island and you, there were lots of things that we were doing with the other yachties and, you know, um, big events and stuff that we went to because it was a rally and there were lots of yachts involved and the lo- there, there was a local organization who was working with us too. It was amazing. But, but suddenly I was also back to that, like backpacker self in a, in a country, you know, like working out the money and finding stuff to eat and exploring and jumping into beak hacks and just, it was extraordinary. And I think that more than anything kind of coming home, I've got some really lovely notes that I wrote in, in Darwin to myself as I came home, you know, I went and had dinner with another writer in Darwin. It was just amazing. And it was a, it, it was that refinding of a, a former self, which is, this is someone who I used to be swanning around exploring um, another country and not worrying about, like I have traveled with, with our two kids, we go to Cambodia quite regularly, um, to do some work there. And so I'm, you know, my most recent experiences of traveling have been loading kids in and out of tuk-tuks and, you know, doing all that kind of stuff. And I love that too. And that's an incredible, that's an incredible experience, but just not discussing which way you're going to turn at the end of a street. Like, yeah, you know? yeah. You just make the decision and go. Ah, oh, just that joy of it. So that I think, think probably now in hindsight was as important as as all that physical stuff of being on the boat and the stuff that I saw that idea that um there was still this other self simmering along underneath who is also part of who I am and and you know like I don't even need to say it to another writer but just in case for people who are watching you know Mim is not me obviously um but that what I was trying to explore in terms of questions about myself and my own life and the lives of my friends and and other people that I know is how we come to terms with accepting, seeing, loving all of those different um, aspects of ourselves. um, Yeah. And, and recognizing that they are all here in the present and they've got their own, um, yeah. they bring that to the fore as well yeah and how and there's a change in the novel I noticed and that I find myself is who's the first person you wanted to share that moment with so the people who aren't there when yeah. something happens who is it that you immediately think of and there's a shift in who she mentions throughout the novel yeah who's the first person thinks she thinks to report back to in some way in different yeah. ways or just thinks you know in terms of oh you know if they'd seen that or yeah sometimes even when you're on your own the bits where it gets sad is where you're like, oh, I wish they'd seen this, this yeah. thing. Yeah. But there's a shift in who she's turning to. Yeah, absolutely. It's really important to her journey. Yeah, I think so too. Man, there's so much. <laughs> and there's so much. And I've not even covered it all. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Like, like, I actually wrote, like, this is so funny. Do you think yeah. underneath it all, the environmentalism... And that people are willing to change what they have the means to change comfortably only. Mm. So we'll all make the, the, the shifts as long as we're still comfortable. Mm. And the kids are good at pointing out these sorts of things to us. But, and this is all lost a little bit in the virus. The environmentalism oh. and the concern there has all kind of fallen away under, well, the pandemic, which is yep. fair enough. But I think it's not like the problems have gone away. No. It's not like the problems have gone away. And, you know, one of the things that I did a lot of reading on was um, the impacts of things like, you know, gold mining in, in Indonesia and in PNG 
uh, and the effects on on local communities and also the lengths to which journalists and activists go in those places and around the world to get their stories out um, and there's some incredible the green watch is incredible there's some incredible news sites which and there's one which actually um, journalists upload their stories to kind of in progress so that if they're killed though their stories will still be published because there are so many in um, activists and journalists reporting on environmental um, crises and disasters around the world who are actually killed in the line of duty so that was something that was that was important to me and i think you know what i wanted to what i wanted to explore there was this idea that you know that there's a, a few different ways that I'm looking at climate crisis and different things in the book and looking at extractive industries as well and, and big mines and, and big business. But um, that the way it is so easy to say that thing happens over there, it's not in my backyard, um, and, and just to, to not know. I think knowing and seeing were such big ideas in the book, that idea of seeing and surveillance and how that can be used for good and for evil and, and and what all that kind of stuff means. So the idea of journalism, I suppose, in a way being the flip side of that kind of departmental surveillance. Um, but, you know, I didn't come up with, I didn't come up with any answers. And I think. No, you shouldn't. I mean, if you did, well, it would be should. weird, wouldn't it? Exactly. But also that I, I still am really torn with the idea of, of, of risking everything to make a, to make a big difference or what could be perceived as a big environmental difference um, or not being able to risk everything. I don't know. It's still something I think it will be a question that, you know, I continue to grapple with and we all do, you know, all the time. Now I'm aware we've been talking now for an hour and do you I'm think so you're sorry, going? No, I was going to say, because I can keep going right now. I knew like, this I would have, happen. I knew there's this would happen. so much. I just, I felt, this is ridiculous. I'm going to read it to you, but you don't have to right. answer it because I don't think it's a question. Um, and I'm thinking, no, what the hell was I thinking? Well, you... Go, go, try me. No, you'll laugh. This is what happens at our breakfast table. Baudrillard's the simulacrum, that the representation is more real than the real or frames the real. Does that stand up in a postmodern world? Okay, okay. well, Anna, that's way too smart for me. <laughs> well, what was I thinking? What was I thinking? We were sitting there having, because the, I said, I do this to my husband who works in academia and I'm out, right? I did my PhD and I, and I'm, and I don't do it any, and that anymore, but I'll occasionally just check with him the state of things. So I'll say to him, so has anything come now? Do we know now what we're in? Because if postmodernism is done, where are we? Are we all in the post-human already or is that not happening yet? And if that's happening, how can you convince me that's not based in language? And then, and he's just sitting there with his coffee going, yeah. Well, there is the actor network theory. And I'm like, don't tell me about that one. I don't want to hear about that one. It's got a stupid name. If they rename it, I'll talk to you about it. But I don't want to know about it until they rename it. This poor guy. Do you guy know what right? I love about it, though? Because what it brings up in me is my constant panic and anxiety that someone will ask me a question. I remember Hannah Kent did it. She used a word. It was like I was fangirling out of my brain, skylarking. We did an event at Readings for skylarking. And she used a word. And I was like, oh my God, it was a live event. Like, I have no idea what she's talking about. And luckily I'd, I'd paid enough attention in all my classes to, you know, like work out the context and work out and, and be able to like put together a thing. But it is my constant fear that someone will ask me a question no. like you just did, Anna. No, and I'll go. It wasn't even a question. Well, maybe it was. Do you know what it was though? I've just remembered what made it happen it was the bit where she's in the boat and she sees the sails and she says, there's nothing that can prepare you for the sound and the feel of how they are. So, and she says in all the books, in all the movies, in all the films, there's nothing that prepares you for this moment. So for her, it was more real than the representation. Yeah, absolutely. Rather than otherwise you see something and you go, oh, that's as pretty as a picture. Well, yeah. it's only pretty to you because it met the expectations you had. Yeah. Whereas yeah. she could never have expected what that would have felt like. And so that was, that was experience. That was real experience. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Which is kind of, I mean, this will take us in another direction too, but, but kind of the idea of writing dystopias at, at the moment and then 
publishing into a dystopia and you know like it's just it's all that same kind of stuff and that suddenly I'm going did I feel that panic when I was writing it or did Mim feel it or is it something that I've now experienced post writing the book in this weird space that we're in and even being able to to talk about it or the you know the surveillance stuff and the <laughs> the government you know the bureaucratic kind of you know we're all in this together all that all that scary stuff that I'm like now, even in my own brain, I can't work out what's real and what, what's not real. <laughs> and then we see everyone virtually. Yes. And then I've just had this real moment of, of that's beyond representation of what it's really like to be on the boat. But I read it in a book. Yeah. There was actually words on a page. But if we can't leave our homes, where are we? And as writers, this, as you say, we're going, it's a tangent. Yeah. Where are we going to get that real experience now? Well, all the grants I had in mind, I've thought to myself, I'm not going to finish that novel because that would be great for a grant. And I yep. could go and do that thing and then write about it. And I've only half written it. So therefore it'll be eligible mm. for a travel grant or whatever. Yeah. Well, what do we do now for real experience? Or does that, yeah, I was just literally writing about this, this this morning as well, or because does that then longing and the nostalgia almost and that, that, deep kind of um yeah want to be connected to a place does that actually then bring something else to the writing so I'll, I'll always remember you know thinking about i think winton wrote one of them cloud street or the writers one of them like on the paris you know osco grant um and has talked about that idea of the separation from place bringing that sensory kind of visceral sense of Australia to the writing, you know, like yeah. are we then moving into a space with all of that talk of, of experience and, and how we write about things? I don't know. It's so interesting, Anna. It's like it blowing is. my mind. It is. And then you think, well, there were some classes, Gulliver's Travels or Robinson Crusoe, and I can't remember which one, but the writer had never left England. Yeah. So are yeah. we going to start doing that? Are we going to start writing? And then you start thinking, well, this is like, this is like, the landscape has an own voices right. So at what point do we get it fact checked? Because yeah. I wrote that I went to um, Gundawindi. Well, I haven't been there for 10 years. Should I get someone from Gundawindi yeah. to do an authenticity check? I know. Because I can't drive there now. I know. Like, it's so hard. And also, because sometimes even when I've been thinking about how much I, you know, talking about the, the boat trip in my research trip is such a central part of the experience of writing the book. And it was to me. But I also you know, don't think that a writer has to go on a boat boat trip to write about a, a boat trip. And I thought about this because I've, I've just, I haven't started it yet, but um, I think Char um, Charlotte McConaughey's The Last Migration, a new book just out, um, which is about following the Arctic turn um, in a kind of, yeah, dystopic future, near future. I don't think she did go on a boat like I was like oh she must have done the one of those arts grants when you know you go right down to the the top and the bottom of the world I don't think that she did um and and yet obviously this is an extraordinary book as well so I you know it's just that weird thing too when I'm I don't know where the boundaries are yeah exactly what am I allowed to write about and I didn't know that when I you know at first and yep. so I could write anything but now that I know more I feel a little bit paralyzed by yeah by the limits of experience and what you've got permission to write about Mm. That's hard. That's really hard. So if you mm. could just find all the answers to that at some <laughs> point, that would be really helpful. You know, the the most useful conversation um, that I've had about permission and, and writing recently, I don't know if it's the most useful, but I, I know that people really responded to it, was our discussion with Angela Savage on the podcast. And, yeah. that, and I think partly because she's done her PhD in it as well, but as an aspect of that. But it, it was a really useful conversation that I sometimes go back to as well. Yeah. She's very inspiring. Mm. And she wrote the Thailand ones, right? Yeah, she wrote um, the, her latest one is... Because I made my mum read them Pearl. all. Yeah. And, yeah, and her latest one is Mother of Pearl. And the other ones are the detective ones. And the detective, because my mum loves all of that. And we, I was born in Thailand and we'd just gone back and she loves to read that? fiction from wherever she's been. And so I said, well, you have to read all of these. So now yeah. she's a big fan. And right. um, so, Love but that was all thanks to the podcast as oh, well. Amazing. Um, and now Angela's doing that amazing knitting of creatures, all the books. The crow and like the... your bookmarks. I'm like, everyone's doing such amazing crafty bookish things. It's, I love it. 
<laughs> yeah, that's what's happened to us all. I, I really need to let you go. I could keep uh, going forever and ever. I'm sorry, but- now I've made it an editing nightmare for you because <laughs> we've just chatted or all. I just bung it all up and go for it. <laughs> because why not? It's a chat. It's a chat. It's not supposed to be an interview. I broke all my own rules, but I had no, I love it. I, I love it. You didn't do acknowledgements. Oh, no, they are in here. Do you know how many there are? Oh, my God. Because I thought, is this the thing? You did the break. No. Nah. You've already done them in the past book. Now you're going to say I'm not doing nah, them. I have got oh. one, two, three, four, five pages. <sighs> because I sent, that tw- I sent that tweet out about saying, like, what should I do? And I asked them, like, I remember really clearly with Skylarking, um, Aviva said, you know, you basically get one back and front page. And I like went back through them and through them and through them again. It was like doing a wedding speech. And then for this one, I was like, ah, oh, what should I do? And Fiona said, have as many pages as you want, go for it. And I was like, well, okay. And enough people had said, enough people had said that as a writer, they read them and they find them really useful. And I was like, well, no one, and no one else will read them. So the writers will, will read them and maybe they'll find it useful. And so then I was like, I'm going for it. I'm still terrified I've left people out, obviously. but Yes. Oh, it's fraught. It's really fraught. And now my mum reads them all in books because she's got an idea of the background of what's going behind it all. She yeah. sent me a message saying, well, someone really loved their editor. You should <laughs> find out who that editor is. And so she's sending me the name. I love it. <laughs> oh, been- forensic <laughs> acknowledgement reader. Amazing. Yeah. So. All right. Oh, uh, congratulations. Thank you. Good luck next week. And Thank you so much. Weeks, and it's going to be great. And you're going to smile and then you can melt down <laughs> in six weeks. Right? Okay. Just hang on. Hang on for that bit. Become a big puddle after that. Thank you so much. So good to speak to you. Mwah, mwah, mwah. <laughs> See you later.